many years for this, but I grew up in Northern California in quite a poor rural area. Some of my best friends from elementary and middle school live like 10 to 15 miles away, so on weekends, instead of just going over to visit for the day, we'd have sleepovers to save our parents driving these crazy round trips. So I had this one friend called Star, whose parents were like old school hippies. Their house always smelled of patchouli, they were vegan before vegan was even really a thing, and aside from a few unusual recreational activities, they were basically just as good as being parents as any other couple. They were sweet, loving, and attentive, and I always had a ball whenever I went to sleepovers at their place, mainly because they'd let us stay outdoors in a tent at night, which was just such a huge adventure for a little group of preteen tomboys. Anyways, this one night we're staying in a tent in the backyard, but it was a backyard that extended to one side of the house. Where we're camped is in the view of the TV room window, so Star's mom and dad could keep an eye on us, but it also meant we could see the driveway from the flap of our tent. It was summertime, so it was still incredibly warm at night, so we ended up leaving the tent flat unzipped to let some cool air in. It obviously wasn't open all the way because bugs, but we can still see outside the tent. Then, in the middle of the night, Star shakes me awake and whispers, There's someone in the driveway. I'm thinking it might have been her big brother, who was a few years older than us and was attending college, but when I suggested that, she said, No, there's a bunch of people, look. I start getting real anxious hearing that, so I quietly creep up to the tent flap to peek out, and that's when I saw that Star was exactly right. In the little bit of moonlight that we had, I literally lost count of the number of people I saw creeping up her driveway. It was seriously one of the scariest moments of my life, mainly because there was absolutely nothing to do but keep as quiet as possible. We couldn't call the cops, this was way before cell phones. We couldn't warn Star's parents without revealing our presence. We were just powerless, forced to watch people who obviously didn't have good intentions slowly approaching Star's house. I think in the end, Star just broke and, in a move you could either call real brave or real stupid, she just ran out of the tent shouting, get away from my house, and then, mom, dad, call the cops. As soon as she starts screaming, a bunch of flashlights burst into life, obviously held by the guy sneaking up the driveway. And oh my god, there were so many of them. At first glance in the darkness, it looked no more than about five or six people, but when they all turned their flashlights on, it was clear the number was more like 15 or 20. I just hear, Sheriff's Department, show me your hands. And that was incredibly confusing because we were all about calling the cops to get help, but like, the cops were already here? Anyway, Star does as she's told, while me and our friends start climbing out of the tent with our hands in the air. That's when the person approaching us started saying, Jesus, they're just kids, man. And with them being closer, I could see that they really were cops, with caps and badges and all patches on their arms, all that stuff. Then I hear, go, 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 get in there. And the cops start bashing the front door to the house in while other cops fanned around the backyard and headed towards one of the barns. We were scared, obviously, but we're so focused on just staying down and watching that we're not really freaking out too bad. But when the cops start dragging Star's mom and dad out of the house and arresting them, she had to be restrained by the cop that was guarding us. After that, the cops drove me and our friend back to our respective homes. Then, I don't know what they did with Star. I think they took her to her grandma's or her aunt's or whatever. Then a few days later, we find out that Star's mom and dad had been growing something they shouldn't have in one of their barns. I get that it was illegal and stuff, but the aftermath was just so sad. Star had to go live with her relatives because her parents were sent off to prison for a few years. It was messed up. And I get that the cops were just doing their job and stuff, but it was definitely one of the scariest times of my life, seeing all those figures in black just creeping towards my friend's house. So, back when I was a kid, me and my best bud were having a sleepover. 
His mom and dad had gotten a divorce a couple months prior, so to counter all the stress of it, he pretty much got whatever he wanted. Not like his mom was spoiling him or anything, she was just being super nice to make sure he wasn't too bummed about his dad leaving. Did it work? Yes and no. Getting to have his friends sleep over, getting an Xbox, a cell phone, and getting much more personal freedom was all well and good, but every so often you could tell the whole thing was getting to him. The good thing was, I got to spend a whole bunch more time with him to give him the support we needed, which coincidentally meant that I was there for one of the worst moments of his childhood. Actually, make that both our childhoods. So, we're having a sleepover, and his mom is having a friend over. Or upstairs, they're downstairs. At one point, I wanted a glass of water, so I head downstairs, but he had to walk through the TV room to get to the kitchen, and when I do, I see my buddy's mom's friend is a dude, and they're getting kind of close, if you know what I'm saying. They jump off each other when I walk into the room. I walk through like, don't mind me, and it's incredibly awkward as I walk back through with my glass of water. Then, I make the mistake of mentioning it to my buddy. He's clearly not happy with the fact that it's a dude. Like, we're ninth graders at this point, so we're pretty savvy to, you know. Anyway, my buddy isn't happy, but he just does his usual thing of internalizing it before distracting himself. Not the best coping mechanism in hindsight, but it is what it is. Then, remember that cell phone I mentioned? Well, his mom bought it for him so he could keep in touch with his dad, which he then does. And guess what's the first thing he tells him? Yep, that there's a strange dude over at his house. I totally blame myself in the moment. It sucked so hard, and when my buddy hung up, turned to me with a smug grin and said, Dad's on his way over. I just knew something bad was going to happen. I kind of wanted to leave, but at the same time, my whole reason for being at that time was being a good friend to Ryan. I had a really healthy family life at home. Like, my mom and dad were a loving, dedicated couple, right up until the day my dad passed. And I'd like to think they raised good kids. But Ryan, his parents were turtle morons. And good God, did that make me feel guilty. So, I stuck around. I knew something horrible was going to happen, but I had zero freaking clue to how bad it would really be. My buddy's bedroom window overlooked his driveway, so when his dad finally did show up, we could see and hear almost everything that went on down there. His dad, and I'm not embellishing here, hurdles up the driveway at like 40 miles an hour, screeches to a stop, and then doesn't even shut his door when he climbed out of his car. Ryan is watching him, looking at him like his dad is a knight in shining armor for a few seconds, right up until he says, Oh crap, I think my dad has a gun. Hearing that final word sent this razor-sharp icicle running right through my guts. I knew there'd probably be shouting and fighting, but shooting? Then all we hear through an open window is, where is he? It was Ryan's dad. He'd banged on the door until his mom answered, and then demanded to know where her guy friend was. Ryan's mom's all like, I don't know what you're talking about. But then Ryan's dad goes from zero to a hundred in a second flat. Don't lie to me, Linda, where is he? He says. There's this very real, palpable pause, and me and Ryan are just on this very tense, nervous feeling, then... His mom says, Who told you? Again, shiver of ice through my stomach, because I'm basically the one who told, and in that moment, I told myself that whatever was about to happen was completely my fault. See? Ryan's dad exploded at the admission. You're a freaking liar, Linda. Now get out of my way. We could hear Ryan's mom screaming for a second. Then we heard another voice, only this one is definitely inside the house. The guy friend. Get off! He screamed. You heard the guy start to shout something at Ryan's dad. Then he just went totally silent. And all you could hear were feet beating against the floorboards downstairs. All before. Bam! 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 Three distinct gunshots that echoed around the house. 
Me and Ryan are just bawling at this point, because we could still hear his mom screaming and we had no idea if she'd been shot, if the boyfriend was dead, if the boyfriend had a gun and fired at Ryan's dad. The whole situation was traumatic enough, but the not knowing, man, that was just the worst. I had to grab Ryan's cell phone off of him to call 911. He just totally shut down from the stress. He'd had a rough enough few months while the whole divorce thing went on, but now he had to deal with potentially a dead mom or dad. I don't blame him, honestly. It was bad enough for me and it wasn't even any of my parents. The three shots were all heard and before the cops showed up, the only sounds we could hear were Ryan's mom crying downstairs. We should have gone to check on her. I know we should have, but the dispatcher told us both to stay put because we didn't know if there was still an active shooter or whatever, so we did as we were told. Thankfully, everyone turned out to be okay and no one was even shot. Ryan's dad had aimed the gun at his mom's friend as, as soon as he'd laid eyes on him, but the guy was quick and just bolted out the back of the house as Ryan's dad pursued. He fired three shots, but it was basically just to scare the guy away at that point, and I heard none of the bullets even went near him. But still, it was terrifying, and Ryan's dad ended up going back to prison for a long while because of it. I remember going to my first ever sleepover in fourth grade. The nighttime was great. We played Nintendo, made a Ford out of the couch cushions in his TV room, everything a kid could dream of. We went to bed way later than usual, told spooky stories while we shined flashlights at the ceiling. It was every part the Norman Rockwell cliche. Right up until the next morning. We wake up bright and early. He heads out to the bathroom, but when he does... I hear his mom whispering something to him in the hallway outside his bedroom. Then, he comes back in and really somberly says, My mom says you gotta go home. Naturally, I ask why, but he shrugs and tells me my mom is already on the way to give me a ride. As you can guess, we were real sad about it, but we'd had a whole bunch of fun the night before, and even kids know that the good times gotta come to an end sometime. Anyway... My mom shows up. I say bye to my friend Mikey and his mom, but I notice that his dad isn't around. He'd been there the night before, and he was a really cool guy, so I asked them to tell him I said bye and thank you, so he didn't think I was rude or anything. Mikey said sure, but his mom just kind of looked off into the distance and stayed silent. I thought that was kind of weird, but it was really early in the morning, so I didn't think much of it. But I definitely noticed how the really fun, warm atmosphere of the night before had been replaced by something much colder. Then, when I got into my mom's car, she too was acting like something terrible had happened. I might have been just nine, but I wasn't dumb, so I remember asking her what was going on, that I knew something weird had happened and I'd rather just know. So, she tells me. She tells me that... While me and my buddy were sleeping peacefully in our pillow fort, his dad had an aneurysm in the next room and was dead before anyone had woken up. It was bad. I know that seems like an understatement, but it was worse than I could have imagined. His mom pretty much fell apart and she and my friend left town shortly afterward to go live with relatives. It's something that haunted me for a long time, knowing I was so close to a death like that as well as seeing how a sudden death can just wreck someone's mental and physical health. Like the last time I saw his mom, she'd lost a whole bunch of weight, a complete shadow of her former self. My buddy looked pretty bad too, but he was definitely taking it much better than she was. That was the last time I saw either of them, when they came over to break the news that they were moving away. It sucked, and we promised to stay in touch, but I guess things don't always turn out the way you want them to. Way back when I first started middle school, it was in a different part of New Jersey, so I didn't really know anyone. 
I was terrified I wouldn't be able to make any new friends, so imagine my relief when I met Jenny. Jenny isn't her real name, and I'm not going to use any real names in this for reasons that will become obvious. So me and Jenny became fast friends, so we decided to have ourselves a little sleepover at her mom's place. Our parents talked it over and we arranged for me to go home with her on a Friday after school, then my mom would come get me on the Saturday morning. The Friday arrives, I catch the bus back to Jenny's place with her, and this marks the first time I ever met Jenny's mom. She seemed weird, to say the least. Jenny's dad wasn't in the picture anymore and I don't think her mom took it very well, because she was the kind of woman who was in the crystals and reiki and all that other spiritual stuff. Maybe she was into that stuff before he left her. The point is, she was that kind of witchy woman, I guess you could say. The evening started off with Jenny's mom being quirky but nice, but at a certain point she started opening bottles of wine and drinking them super fast. Like even at 13 I'd recognize that there was something not right about the way she drank. But given I was spending most of my time in Jenny's room, I didn't think it'd really matter. Wrong. Because at one point Jenny's mom walks into her bedroom where we're hanging out and half collapses down into the bed with a, what's you girls doing? I don't know if other people can relate to this, but I always used to find drunk adults to be really, really creepy. Seeing how something as simple as a drink could change them so much and not even for the better. Ugh, it made my skin crawl. But a scary story about, oh poor me, I don't like drunk people, that's not what you guys are here for. So I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that that's not the scary part. The scary part was when Jenny's mom started channeling spirits. It was legitimately one of the creepiest freaking things I'd ever seen. Seeing this grown woman trying to change her facial features and her voice to make out what the dead were talking through her. I knew it wasn't real. I was 13, not dumb, but seeing her, like, believe it was happening, it was honestly one of the most disturbing things I'd ever seen. She'd pretend to be some long-dead murderer and talk about the murders they committed. Then she'd pretend to be a child cancer patient talking about how scary it was to die so young. Sick stuff like that. And we had to listen to her drone on for like an hour or so, telling us all kinds of things that 13-year-old girls should definitely not be hearing. Eventually, she tired herself out and passed out on Jenny's bed. She just excused her mom and we continued the sleepover in the TV room. I was mortified for her, but to Jenny, this was the most normal thing in the world. Then, about four or five months later, just before summer break, Jenny's mom suffered a complete nervous breakdown and tried to stab her with a bread knife. It was a whole thing in our town and I don't think I'd ever seen Jenny again. Thankfully, she did end up getting adopted by a distant cousin who lived a few towns over and so we still got to hang out every once in a while. But her mom was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and I know that had a really negative effect on her. Me and Jenny lost touch after high school but if she's out there and she just so happens to be reading this, I hope you're okay. I miss you and I hope you and your mom are doing just fine now. Back in elementary school, I was invited to a friend's birthday for a sleepover. It was an awesome time, but I woke up the next morning feeling really sick with a really high temperature. My dad comes to give me a ride home and honestly, I just thought it was all the candy I ate the night before. But I just get worse and worse throughout the day and by the next morning, I'm in a really bad way. So, mom takes me down to the doctor's office, I tell him how I'm feeling and he gives me a look over. Then, right where my ankle meets my knee, there was a little spot that was all puffy and red, kind of like a pimple. Then I remembered that on the night of the sleepover, I tripped and fallen on some old wooden stairs and grazed my knee. But that was literally all it was, just a graze. How in the world could whole body aches and pains be the result of a grazed knee? The doctor even suggested I might have been bitten by a brown recluse spider and just like, not noticed. 
like that was even possible. But then it was correctly diagnosed as a staph infection. Only, it had been diagnosed too late and was spreading fast and was also literally eating at the muscle inside my leg. The doctors had to actually tunnel into the kneecap and the whole thing had to be kept packed with fresh gauze every day. I don't think words can even broach how painful the whole thing was and I'm not even exaggerating when I say that I almost lost my leg over it. All that over tripping on some old wooden stairs. It makes you realize how fragile life really is. I think we were about 11 or maybe 12 at this time, but me and my maid were having a sleepover in my room. Me in my bed and her on a mattress between my bed and the window. Out of absolutely nowhere, we hear this massive bang and my wall-length window totally shatters. Shards of glass fly clean across the room and as much as it wasn't painful at the time, I knew I was being absolutely cut to ribbons as all these pieces hit me. Me and my mate both start screaming and going mental as we ran out of the room. Both of us are covered in blood and we're cutting our feet as we run, which only makes the screams worse. My dad flies into action shuts us into the pantry to keep us safe, then grabs a kitchen knife before running into the back garden to look for the person who may have been behind the window smashing. But apparently, there wasn't a soul to be seen. So he rings the police, tells them what happened, and two coppers turn up at our house to check out my room. It's then that they find a huge solid ball bearing, presumably from a truck or an airplane. It had landed less than 20 centimeters from where my friend's foot had been. If it had hit one of us, it could have killed us. There are no roads or anything near us, and my room faced into the back fence, so to this day, we still have no clue where it came from or how it was traveling at such a speed it cleared possibly multiple fences and smashed a window. The only other way is if it fell from an aircraft, but even then... The police said it would have done considerably more damage if it would have fallen from thousands of feet up. My mom had been out getting us Happy Meals while this whole ordeal went on, so she was more than a little shocked when she arrived home. Needless to say, those Happy Meals were sorely needed. This was at least 20 years ago now, back when cybersecurity wasn't as good as it is now and anonymous chat rooms were still very much a thing. I was 12 years old and my friend was sleeping over at my place. We went online when my parents were asleep and signed on to MSN chat rooms. Whenever we got asked our ASL, we'd always put something like 15F US because we didn't want people to think we were kids so we thought we'd put 14 years or 15 years to see if we could get some cooler, older boys to talk to us. Think 15 to 16 year olds. But to our surprise, we started getting a crazy number of messages from guys in their 30s, 40s, and even 50s. And like 90% of these guys went from hi to very lewd messages in mere seconds. It was so gross. It was basically a deluge of super inappropriate questions and... The worst thing was, when we told guys we lied and we were only 12, most of them didn't even seem to care at all. One of them even got super excited and asked if we wanted to see him over webcam, which we most certainly did not. We were just horrified and ended up closing the window once we were suitably creeped out. Now that I'm older, I think back on stuff like that and realize just how badly we were playing with fire. Not only that, but it makes me wonder just How many people are out there who enjoy stuff like that? How horrifyingly easy it can be back then to do those types of things to kids online. I just hope it's a lot safer these days because I want kids at some point and obviously they're going to have access to the internet. I just worry how I'm going to keep them safe when there are so many predators out there trying to take these kids away from those that love them.
I think all kids think their parents are strict. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Like, I used to think my parents were strict because I had to set bedtime and curfews on weekends, but then I stayed over to a friend's house for the first time when I was 13, and I changed my entire view of my parents. Because his mom was an actual tyrant. Like, it was scary to watch. We live in a rural area, my friend even more so. Like, again, I thought I lived out in the sticks, but he lived miles from even the smallest towns, like right on the outskirts of Galloway Forest Park. It was a nice wee gaff, but it was old school, proper old school. Like all of the locks were latches instead of key locks, which meant all of the doors were accessible from the inside and outside, including bedrooms and bathrooms. On the evening in question, we had a nice enough time, watching James Bond movies in between rounds of deathmatch on N64's GoldenEye. Admittedly, I was a proper little mummy's boy at the time, and I was pretty uncomfortable at sleeping over at a friend's place, more so because of the distance from home. But like I said, the evening was good up until a point. We were both immersed into the whole Bond lore, stuffing ourselves with pizza and arguing over Brosnan versus Connery. Then, as we're talking, my friend's mum comes into the lounge, calmly walked up to him, then gives him the biggest, loudest, hardest slap in the face I'd ever seen like it was almost more like an open palm smack than anything else. I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, not a parent hitting a child anyway. So, in the seconds that followed, I was literally just like, what just happened? My mate burst into tears, crying, gets up and runs upstairs with his mum in hot pursuit, and the whole time she's screaming stuff like disgusting at him. I was just dumbstruck. There I was, Chilling with my mate when his mum just comes up and annihilates his face for apparently no bloody reason whatsoever. Anyway, they both disappear upstairs and I'm left on my own to wonder what's going on. I just stay there, not knowing what else to do waiting for them to reappear. When they do, my mate just plonks himself on the sofa, red in the face, eyes all puffy from crying. Then, when his mum is out of earshot, I asked what happened. Turns out that she smacked him square in the face because he was eating with his mouth open. Yep, eating with his mouth open. That's all he did to deserve that open palm punch to the face. After that, I was petrified of this guy's mum. I mean, we didn't have very many sleepovers at his place, and I have a few more stories involving the absence of any privacy because of those old lock situation. Don't get me wrong. I know there's way more harrowing things out there as an adult, but the way she treated him was the most abusive parenting I'd ever seen. This guy's parents were some of the scariest people I'd encountered in my life, let alone my childhood. If he was punished that bad for just eating with his mouth open, what else did the poor kids suffer through for other seemingly minor infractions? It made me feel very, very lucky to have the parents I did. Let me just put it that way. I had a sleepover when I was about eight or nine. Me and my best friend were watching the Scooby-Doo episode with the creepy voodoo dolls. We're having a whale of a time, enjoying all the wholesome spooks, but when she sees the voodoo dolls, I can see my friend getting visibly nervous. I knew her mom was hardcore Christian and looked down on all that kinds of magical or satanic stuff, but I had no idea just how bad she'd fly off the handle when she caught us watching freaking Scooby-Doo, of all things. Bearing in mind it was my friend who put the show on in the first place, but when my friend's mom wanders in to see what we're watching, she just assumes it was me that put it on. She yanks me up from sitting, then proceeds to scream in my face that I was disgusting and that I was going to hell for making her daughter watch that kind of filth. And right as I'm about to burst into tears, she slaps me so hard across the side of the head. I just lost it, bolted up to her bedroom, locked myself inside, and called my dad. She's banging on the door telling me she's going to beat me for being a sinner. My dad can hear this, and just yells, I'm on my way into the phone before passing it to my mom. I was so scared, 
more scared than I think I ever was during my entire childhood, and the minutes of waiting in that locked bedroom for my dad to show up were some of the longest of my whole life. When he showed up, I was in the back bedroom, so the only way I knew he was there was when my friend's mom answered a banging at the door and started screaming at someone. I ran down the stairs, and as soon as he saw me, my dad basically pushed the woman on her butt, grabbed me, and then we got out of there. It was a whole drama after that. The police were involved, charges were filed, but the worst part, it totally soured my friendship with the girl who I was having the sleepover with. I wasn't ever allowed to visit her house, and her mom pretty much ordered her not to hang out with me anymore. It was sad, really sad, but I guess that's just how life is sometimes. Please don't think I'm trying to throw myself a pity party here because I'm doing much better in my adult life. But back when I was a kid, I had an incredibly toxic home life and as a result, I went to school basically with little to no social skills. I made just one friend and even then it was only on accident because she was being nice to me after I tripped and broke my toy on the bus. Her name was Rachel. Rachel's BFF was named Emily and Emily was the prettiest, coolest girl in class. So imagine my delight when one day I find myself getting an invite to Emily's birthday sleepover. To this day I can remember how excited I was. My first sleepover. It was indescribably validating. I beamed at that invitation over and over again like it was a trophy or something and begged my mom to give me a ride to the sleepover early. I didn't want to miss a single minute of it. Then, on the night of the sleepover, I found it wasn't quite as enjoyable as I thought it would be. It was a real fun atmosphere and all, but Emily and Rachel weren't exactly being very warm with me, and I could really obviously detect it. Then, right as I'm lying on my back with a pillow under my head, just relaxing, I feel Emily straddle my stomach while Rachel seems to hold my legs down. Emily then grabs the pillow out from under my head, shoves it over my face, then proceeds to tell me how ugly I am and how she never wanted to invite me. It hurt. Emotionally, I mean. It cut really, really deep. But that feeling was nothing to the one I felt when I realized I couldn't breathe. I struggled and struggled, but still that horrid little girl kept that pillow over my face until I felt myself passing out. It was only when her mom walked in to see what all the fuss was about that she took it away from my face. I still can't see their names without remembering how awful that memory is to me, but I'm glad to say that there were definitely repercussions. Rachel was grounded for a long time for letting it happen. I know that, but Emily ended up getting like a psychological evaluation or whatever, which revealed that she had some serious personality disorders. This was all part of her being arrested as a juvenile and she only narrowly avoided attempted murder charges. It caused a huge thing in our community, and it was so bad that, in the end, Emily's parents had to just pack up their family and leave town. But before I end this, let me say it again. I'm not looking for sympathy here. All that stuff is long in the past. Childhood was not kind to me, but I promise you, these days I'm in a much better place and surrounded by all the friends a girl could possibly wish for. And only two of them are cats. Back when I was a kid, I had this friend in elementary school. We were super close, sat next to each other in class, hung out every recess and lunch. So, at one point, we planned a little sleepover. My parents' place was kind of small at the time, but... She lived in this big old house with her grandparents, so it was arranged we'd have our sleep over there instead. I never found out why she lived with them or where her parents were, but I distinctly remember my mom and dad telling me not to ask her questions about them for obvious reasons in hindsight. The only thing was, my friend seemed really, really set on having the sleep over at my place. I mean, to the point where, when we had no choice but to have it at her grandparents' place, she seemed to not want to have a sleepover anymore. 
I had to convince her to have it at her place just because I was so excited about the idea of having the sleepover in general. Anyways, it comes to the night of the sleepover, I go over to her grandparents' place and it's every bit as fun as I imagined. We watch movies up in her room, had pizza delivered, ate ice cream right out of the tub, and her grandparents seemed really sweet and nice. Then I think it was around 9pm, her grandpa knocks on the door, pokes his head in and tells us that he and my friend's grandma are headed to bed, so we're to keep the noise down. We're like, okay, good night. He leaves, and we carry on with our night. A little while after, I get up and head over to the door, telling my friend I needed to use the bathroom. She jumps up, throws herself between me and the door, and is like, you can't go out there. You wake up grandpa. I tell her not to worry and that I'd creep down the hall on tippy toes so as not to wake him, but my friend still refuses to let me leave the room. I think she's actually playing around for a second and I'm like, quit it, and try to get past her, but she actually shoves me back away from the door with this angry look on her face. I didn't want to start a fight with her after all. The whole objective was to keep as quiet as possible, but still I needed to use the bathroom. So I asked her where I'm going to go and get this. She reaches under her bed and pulls out one of the plastic stationary trays. You know, like the inbox and outbox kind you put paper in? Yeah, that kind. She points at this paper tray and it's just like, go in this. Again, I think she might be playing a weird and cruel sort of trick on me, but she's deadly serious. She actually wanted me to pee in that stationary tray. So I did. It was super gross, but I did it, and instantly, the mood is just destroyed. I had nothing to clean myself up with. I'm pretty sure I peed a little on my nightgown. It was just all kinds of disgusting. But still, my friend won't let me go to use the bathroom to wash up. The weirdest thing was, she acted like it was normal. She never did anything like that at my house, and she definitely didn't seem like that kind of kid, like she wasn't known as the stinky kid in school or whatever. The whole thing just kind of blew my mind and although I didn't let it affect our relationship or friendship or anything, I definitely didn't like to stay over at her house again. We stayed close for a long time after but ended up going to different high schools because she moved in with her aunt over in St. Paul. We kept in touch using MySpace back when that was still a thing but I never got to the bottom of her weird nocturnal bathroom habits, not until well after her grandpa passed away. When he died, she seemed to take it really bad. When I called her, she broke down crying so bad that she had to hang up and she wouldn't return any of my texts, no matter how much I begged her to get in touch. In the end, me and my mom looked up her aunt's home phone number and called ahead before we drove over. The aunt seemed more than happy to talk to us, but with the caveat that she had something very, very serious to tell us. My friend's grandpa had been doing stuff to her. Whenever her grandma was asleep, she got up to use the bathroom or whatever. Her grandpa would hear her come out of his room and... God, I can't even bring myself to say it. Turns out he'd done the exact same thing to her mom too and that's like half the reason she wasn't in the picture anymore. One of the other reasons was the drug use, which is why no matter how much she insisted on custody not being given to the grandparents, a judge ignored her and did it anyway. I think they were just so terrified of him that they just couldn't talk about it, ever, and it was only after he died that it all came spilling out in various forms. The aunt that she was living with was her mom's cousin, so obviously wasn't around for what was happening when they were kids. It was absolutely horrifying hearing about it just as her friend, so I can only imagine how terrible the aunt felt, knowing she was so close to the abuse but just not being able to see it. And then it all made sense to me, why she didn't want me walking down the hall at night, why she'd taken to peeing in a stationary tray that she kept hidden under her bed. She wasn't being mean or weird when she made me do it, she was protecting me. No wonder she didn't want me to have this sleepover in her place, and I'm really not trying to make this whole thing about me when I say this, but I feel horribly guilty for not saying anything to my parents at the time. I didn't want to embarrass her. She was my friend. My best friend. But that's just the thing about being a kid, isn't it? 
That naivety. You do dumb stuff, even if you don't mean to. And that's what my therapist tells me anyway, and I try to believe it. I really do. But part of me will forever remain convinced that, somehow, I'm kind of to blame, too. I went to a sleepover when I was a kid. I think I was like maybe seven years old, maybe even eight. It's late at night, we're playing with stuffed animals in a room. At one point I got up to go to the bathroom. As I said be right back to my friend, she replied, make sure you lock the bathroom door, in a happy, chipper voice. Kind of a no-brainer, so I just left the room without even thinking about it. I passed her parents' bedroom, walked into the bathroom, then, you guessed it, locked the door. Then I heard some shifting outside, so thinking someone else needed to go, I tried to pee as quietly as possible. Then the doorknob starts twisting, but obviously it's locked, so it doesn't open. You think the person on the other side would have gotten the message, occupado, you know? Then, whoever it was started twisting the doorknob, like, manically or something. I know this sounds kind of naive all these years later, but I thought it was maybe my friend playing a prank. So, not wanting to seem like a coward, I just finished my business and tried to remain unshook. I tried to breathe silently, waited a few minutes until the coast was clear, then bolted back into my friend's room. I figured I'd find her reveling in the chaos she wrought, mwahahaha, or something to that effect, but when I returned, she didn't seem to have moved. She just smiled and asked me to shut the door behind me. Now, I know that seems pretty routine, but there was something kind of odd about this request. I slept with my door shut too, I mean, who doesn't? But when she asked me, it seemed like her smile was off just a little when she spoke, like her grin was pitched to the edges, almost like it was forced, almost as if though she was scared. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I stayed awake, watching the door in the dark. I never went back for another sleepover. The next time I returned for a play date, she mentioned that her dad had punished her recently for not locking the door to the bathroom. She was in the shower. He threw open the bathroom door and started filming her on a camcorder to teach her about privacy. Can you believe that? No wonder she was so on edge all the time. And I shudder to think about the punishments I didn't hear about, but honestly, what really scares me is thinking about what her dad would have done had he gotten his hands on me that night. The single most messed up memory from my childhood involves dictaphones. You know those little voice recorder things with the little tiny tapes? Yeah, I used to think they were so cute. Now they trigger me super hard. And before you all call me a snowflake or whatever, listen to my story. When I was around 11 years old, 5th grade anyway, I went to sleep over at a friend's house. We stayed up late, doing all the stuff you'd expect young ladies to get up to at a sleepover. Then we all passed out and slept through the night. The next morning, the girl whose house it was, her dad comes into the kitchen with a little dictaphone in his hand. He's got a big smile on his face and right in front of us, he starts playing the tape back. We all hear our own voices, talking about our crushes and all this other stuff. He'd been recording us, and apparently he'd hidden the recorder in one of her stuffies or something. I'm honestly kind of freaked out by this, but I'm too shy to actually call him out on it, so we all just sort of let it go and chalk it up to a weird dad behavior. Years later... The girl and her weird dad move away and we all lose contact as we go our separate ways. Then, about 14 years later, the girl finds me on Facebook. We do a little small talk, catching up on this and that, and then the girl drops something heavy on me. She asks if, during that sleepover, all those years back, if I remember anything weird involving her dad. I'm all like, sure, he recorded us, that was incredibly weird. A little bit of a total invasion of privacy, maybe? She's like, no, anything else. 
I had to tell her no because honestly, nothing else did happen. But the question sparked off a little online reunion, with all the girls who had social media getting in touch with one another because we'd all been asked the same question. It took a while for the truth to come out, but to our horror, we discovered that the girl had been getting abused by her father. The whole idea of recording our conversations that night wasn't part of some kooky prank or whatever. It was him making sure she didn't say anything about it to her friends. Of all the dark or scarier incidents from my childhood, that one takes the cake. Not so much because of how horrible it is, and it is horrible, but because of how he basically gloated to us, playing it back because he knew she didn't say a freaking thing about it. I think he escaped justice in the end. I'm not even sure she started investigating, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, until he was long gone. She's doing fine, by the way, but I still think about her from time to time and hope she really is doing okay as she says she is. Back when he was 12, I dropped my son off at a new friend's house for a sleepover. It was his first friend after we had just relocated from far away, one of the downsides of the Marine Corps. They lived on the outskirts of a town that is already super rural, and a house with the backyard leading out into some woods. The plan was the boys would be camping in a tent in their yard. I met the dad, dude seemed chill enough, but then I met the man's girlfriend and the risk of sounding a little rude, she was a sour-faced, toothless hag, complete with a lit cigarette hanging from her mouth who didn't have a single nice thing to say about anything. I figured the dad had a terrible choice in women, but that my kid would otherwise be okay. At least the boys would be in the woods, in the tent, away from the hag, so I thought. When I got home after dropping my son off, I did a CCAP search, for those who don't know, it's a circuit court public record, and discovered that the man just got out of jail for assaulting a woman in a public bathroom and that his first wife had a restraining order filed against him. Ten minutes later, I'm back at my kid's friend's place, telling them how I'm really sorry, but that there's a family emergency. And, you know, in my mind, it's not paranoid to run those kinds of checks. It's diligent. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations, and I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon. <laughs>